I welcome you all to the online ORF discussion on the theme National League for Democracy second term in Myanmar. The November elections in Myanmar witnessed the reinstatement of the National League for Democracy Party for the next five years. In contrast to the wave of optimism that greeted the NLD's landslide victory in 2015, the elections this year were held amid surging COVID-19 outbreak, mountain ethnic conflicts and economic hardship. The massive electoral win reflects faith among the populace on the NLD government and its de facto leader on San Suu Kyi. In this respect, the NLD's second term holds importance for the country and the region at large. Several problems faced by the NLD in the first term will continue to pose challenges, including political reforms and economic conflicts. Furthermore, the economic impact of the global pandemic and growing major power competition in the region are going to add to the existing challenges. To discuss these themes today, we have a panel of very prominent and well-known experts who I would like to introduce without much further ado. So our first speaker for today is Michael Lubina, who is an associate professor of political science at Jagiellonian University, Poland. Please correct me if I'm wrong in my pronunciation. He has uh, majored in Myanmar and he has also authored seven books, the recent one being, being a political biography of Aung San Suu Kyi, a hybrid politician which has come out just two months ago. Our second speaker is Bertil Littner. He is a Bangkok-based correspondent for Asia Times. He is a former correspondent with the Far Eastern Economic Review and the author of several books on Burma, Myanmar now. Bertel has written, written at length about Myanmar, China, North Korea, India in various local, national and international publications over 30 countries. Our third speaker today is K. Yome, Senior Fellow Observer Research Foundation who has written and worked extensively on this region. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, before we begin, a note for our viewers, please feel free to send in your comments and questions in the Q&A section that appears on your screens. We'll take them up in the next segment of this conversation. So to start off, we'll have introductory remarks by each speaker. So Michael Lubena, first, please go ahead. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Many thanks for Observer Research Foundation for organizing it and also honored to be uh, able to speak among such great specialists in the field. So thank you so much. Um, in the leaflet, there are three major uh, topics mentioned uh, about this webinar. One concerns uh, um, the nld tatmadaw relations, relationship. The other one uh, is about the ethnic process and the third one is about geopolitics. So I will now um, briefly uh, say about it. Um, I will start from the last one. Uh, because it's the easiest one. Uh, as a rule, it's always easier to talk about geopolitics than about dyna the domestic dynamics. And in case of Myanmar, it's even more so. Burmese foreign policy shows clear signs of continuity and though Su is not an exception here, at least if, if her first term is to be taken into account. She's loyal to the long Burmese tradition of neutral foreign policy. This tradition can be traced back to 1950s or even to Mindon, if we can look at it this way. Um, and as far as China is concerned, because in the, the, the first uh, question, the, the geopolitical, geopolitical question uh, concerns the rising China issue, so as far as China is concerned, there is a deep entrenched anxiety in Myanmar about two general foreign policy threats looming over Myanmar in more general terms. One is from China and the other one is from Bangladesh and Bengal in more general terms. If the latter is more about population issue, then the former is multidimensional, geopolitical, political, economic, social. And uh, it's combined, of course. All three are, by the way, combined. All these topics are combined, but I will divide them for analytical purposes. Um, so China's importance cannot be underestimated. It is Myanmar number number one foreign policy challenge. But it's not only threat. Uh, it's uh, it's also a way to. It, China offers a way to develop the country, even if it's imperfect, even if we consider it imperfect. Uh, the giant influence uh, China has on, uh, on Myanmar produces a reality where every Burmese leader has to be on good terms with China or workable terms. 
while not strong, begin to fall a, a neo-colonial style dependency, or say Sri Lanka style dependency. In other words, China offers developments, uh, special economic zone, regional connectivity, transportation, many other, but it also can mean debt trap and subordination, just like Laos or Cambodia. Um, so it forces the, the Burmese to balance China delicately. And I think so far, Dosu has achieved that. I think her foreign policy is her biggest, uh, one of the biggest assets. Um, uh, she, uh, she has good relations with China. She, uh, she improved the relations between Myanmar and China after meets on uh, uneasiness. Uh, but at the same time, she's not at the mercy of, uh, of China. Uh, so I predict this hedging or soft balancing to continue. If history is any guide, then uh, I will expect Myanmar under second term of those two to follow the deeply entrenched Burmese foreign policy instincts to stay away from geopolitical competition in order to survive. Uh, it's of course another question arises to which extent uh, Myanmar will be able to conduct this, this sort of policy, but uh, at, the, at least they will try. And uh, now, now as for the other two domestic topics, they are much more difficult to predict. Uh, the relationship between the NLD and the Tatmado is complex and again multidimensional. Uh, in its first term, the NLD was all about caution. Um, some uh, named the policy, the, the NLD policy, um, uh, letting the sleeping dog, dogs lie. Uh, I would say it was in a, in a way Tatmado first policy. And that was a necessity, like NLD had to behave this way in order to survive. Uh, and it did survive, which is an achievement. Five years ago, um, it was not so obvious. Uh, at the same time, the NLD has tried to limit the influence of Tatmada without provoking it. So it was a sort of Burmese crap tactics. Um, uh, and they achieved some minor successes, like taking over the GAD. Um, uh, but they did not cross that Maddow's red lines. Um, uh, that was the rational consideration which trumped uh, every other aspect of, uh, of, of governance. Um, as for the Tatmado generals, they might have been irritated by some actions, for example, the state councilor bill, but ultimately they are, uh, the, the NLD government, government is tolerable for them. It's, uh, of course, they would prefer USDP, but USDP is a political fiction scenario, let alone after the elections. What they did after the election was a, I would say, be serious Trump style um, theater. Uh, so th they are not, a, uh, they are not a, a, a well, um, an, an alternative for now. So from that model's perspective, uh, an NLD that behaves in a non-confrontational manner is tolerated. So this reality, this complex reality, produces a tense but manageable relationship, at least for now. There is a mutual distrust and dislike um, but it's less than it used to be. Um, they may not like one another and compete for power, yet they gradually respect each other and need one another. So I expect this tense but manageable relationship to continue, albeit with modifications. And the major modification, of course, the new major variable is the fact that NLD is now empowered by its second thundering victory. So they have now or never moments. And uh, what will those two do? Some say she will challenge the army to secure her place in history, but I don't think so. I don't think she will go for all. That is, she will, I don't think she will try to amend Article 109 or Article 436. I think she will try to concentrate on trying to leave, uh, lift the ban on, uh, on herself. That is uh, Article 57F. And some say about the great bargain perspective. I would say it's unlikely, to, though not impossible. Um, uh, for that, uh, we would need much more trust among, uh, among both sides, and this trust is still lacking. Um, and as for ethnic issue, this is, of course, the, the, the most difficult, the most complex uh, thing, the Gordian knot. Um, well, politically and historically speaking, the Bama majority is too strong and too unwilling to share power and privilege, and yet too weak to enforce its vision of society completely. And so this, uh, this uh, sort of Myanmar-style unity in diversity has never been there. Um, uh, Panlor or Pinlong was only partial answer and unfulfilled uh, um, ultimately what Suchi did with her uh, new Panlong, third Panlong effectively. Some say it's second, but it's third. Um, uh, well, uh, she ultimately, she was not able to propose a way out of the fundamental structural contradiction between the Tatmado's priority, that is demanding ethnic armies to disarm and demobilize, 
and the ethnic federal agenda. One would say, I would say to her defense that that would require a political genius to resolve this ethnic issue, but still the result of her action failure stands. Um, um, and her Tatmadaw's first policy meant that with time she herself noticeably sided with the Tatmadaw's position on ethnic issue. Again, we can say that she had to, but, uh, but um, that means the perspective uh, um, um, of uh, securing peace is still far, far away. It doesn't mean, however, that the NLD cannot do anything. It can do much beyond the constitutional restriction in both formal and informal spheres. For example, it can be more inclusive in terms of cadres policy, nominating union ministers, for example. Recently, like last month, there was this letter to 48 parties. That was a sort of step in the right direction. But uh, it will be still difficult and I would say counterintuitive for the NLD to overcome the winner takes it all mentality. Uh, although I expect some improvements in the ethnic relations, I cannot envision a breakthrough. So I would have to be wrong. Uh, well, to summarize all those three issues, I predict three times continuation, albeit, albeit with modifications, and these modifications are, of course, very much important. Thank you so much, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, other uh, experts. I will now request Bertil Littner to share his remarks. Okay, there are basically three issues here. The first is, uh, civil military relations and connected with that is the question of constitutional reform. The second is the ethnic so-called peace process and the third, the geopolitics. So if we start from the beginning, we have to remember that elections in Myanmar is not the same as an election in India or an election in Europe because before they even allowed uh, elections to take place, the military adopted a constitution, which was adopted by after basically a fraudulent referendum in 2008, which was tailored such that it wouldn't really alter the basic power structure of the country. It would create a hybrid system, give some space to, uh, to the civilian side of, of society, but the military will remain the most powerful institution in the country. And it remains so by uh, keeping three ministries to itself, and also the three most important ministries. Defense, uh, the home ministry, which includes the internal security apparatus, and third, border affairs. And the rest, the civilian government can, can take care of. So then comes the question, can this be changed? Well, no, it can't, because in addition to having those three ministries under the head, uh, they also appoint 25% percent to all the MPs in the upper house, the lower house, in the, all the regional and state assemblies. <clears throat> in order to change any important clause in the constitution, the 2008 constitution, more than 75 percent have to vote in favor of such proposals, which means that the military has little rights. So no, no constitutional changes can take place without the military agreeing to it. So they still hold that absolute power over on the kind of constitutional changes and the constitutional power. And then it comes to that question, which is actually more interesting. Uh, in 1990, the military supported the National Unity Party, which was the offspring of the, the ruling, the formerly ruling Burma Socialist Program Party, which was set up after the coup in 62 and dominated by the military. <clears throat> The NUP did extremely <laughs> badly in that, in that uh, election. And after the election, it basically vanished from the scene. And the next time that an election was allowed, in which was you know, co-decided three or five, 2010, uh, the military set up a new organization. It was originally called the USDA, A for the Association. And it was modeled after Indonesia's Volcar, a kind of military directed mass movement, right? But then they changed it to peace and became the USDP, the Union Similarity and Development Party. Well, they won the election in 2010 because there was still no competition at that time. But in 2015, uh, they lost badly, as badly as the NUP did in 1990. So the question is, well, how much longer will the military continue to support losing parties? And we also have to remember that the USDP, although it's made up, or the leadership is made up of former military officers, it's old guys. And I don't think the young officers in the military, in the Tamado, can relate to them at all. 
it will make much more sense from the military's point of view to enter in some kind of understanding or a symbolic relationship with the NLD. And I think that is going to happen. And the USDP may even say it into, into the background. Because who wants to support a loser? But will this lead to the militaries agreeing to constitutional changes? I doubt it, not for the foreseeable future. May happen sometime, you know, after the next election, but not during the five years which are ahead of us right now. <clears throat> then comes the ethnic so called peace process. Uh, what's happening there? Well, it's very easy to answer that question. It's not only dying, it's dead. And it's dead because it started off on the wrong foot from the very beginning when former president or then president thinks and launched it in 2012. They wanted everyone to sign a nature of a ceasefire agreement before any meaningful talks about the political future of the country could be held. But it's putting the cart before the horse. And it wasn't going to work. And then it's a face saving gesture before the 2015 election. They managed to get eight groups, which later became 10 groups, to sign this so called NCA. But if we look at, closely look at these eight, uh, eight plus two, two groups later on, only two of them actually, two of those 10 groups, have any armies. One is the RCSS, the Restoration Council of Shell State, and the other one is, is the Korean National Union. The rest are basically NGOs, a small, tiny group of no significance at all. And in fact, some of them were so insignificant, so the authorities even have to give them an area where they could set up a base and a camp and get some new uniforms to put on their newly recruited soldiers. A Myanmar friend of mine actually put it quite succinctly. He said that if anyone would like to disarm those groups, someone would have to give them some weapons first. And that is actually what happens. Some of them were given weapons just to shore up the credibility. So more than 80% of all the soldiers in ethnic armed organizations in the country, they belong to organizations which have not signed in there, have not signed and say you're not going to do it either. So there you actually, if they want to get that process going because it never went anywhere, they would have to start from the beginning again. And the only way to do that is to forget about this NSA and enter into meaningful discussions about the future of the country. What kind of country should it be? Should it be a federal union? Or should it be a centralized state with a very strong center? You know, like what is it? It's now, in, <coughs> you could say. And uh, that issue would have to be discussed. So when you look at peace process elsewhere in the world, they usually follow the same, follow the same pattern. The military, will, or not the military, or the government in the military would announce a ceasefire. We talk, we reach a consensus, we sign a political binding agreement. That's a normal process. What will happen in Colombia, in the FARC? Yeah, the, the Nazi ceasefire, there were years of talks in Cuba, and then eventually they reach a consensus and they sign an agreement. And maybe even that agreement is shaky because they had to go to referendum and it was rejected. But no, anyway, that is the way to forward. And as long as they insist on the group signing the NCA, and insist on inventing new armed organizations which never existed before, it's not going to work. And uh, the most, in the most recent development is actually between the KNU and the Tamado, where there's been fierce clashes in some of the areas controlled by the KNU, total the violation of the so-called ceasefire. So not, it's not nationwide, and it's not a ceasefire. And they, in order to solve that, they actually have to go back to the fundamental problem it's been the most problem since independence in 48. The Federal Union or a centralized state. They talk about the geopolitics. <clears throat> well, we have to remember that the opening up of, yes, which we experienced in 2010 and 2011, was not happen, it did not happen by <clears throat> chance. I have in my possession classified documents from the Tamado, from the military, dating back to 2004, that long stating very clearly that we are becoming a colony of China, our independence and sovereignty are at stake. We have to improve relations with the West. This is the way to do it. That's exactly what they have done. It was not that one day the journalists woke up and had a sort of democratic awakening experience. There was necessity that forced them into opening up the country. 
And they did so quite according to a plan. They stuck to the plan ever since. So the, the dependence, of course, is, on, is on, on China. Because China was the only country that really had close relations with Myanmar when it was subjected to international boycotts and sanctions and that sort of thing. And suddenly, Myanmar turned from being the pariah of the West, become the darling of the West. Hillary Clinton went there, Obama went there, everyone went there, and they praised this fantastic transition to democracy. Well, all that ran to a halt in 2017 when the Rohingya crisis broke out. And hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many, and I don't trust the figures that I've seen, were driven into exile in Bangladesh. Suddenly, there were talks about you know, sanctions and boycotts, the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, and the West turned its back on Myanmar once again. So China then came back, and China came back with a vengeance. And I don't think that, I agree with initially that Myanmar always wanted to stay as neutral as it possibly can. But it was imp impossible during the years of sanctions, and it became impossible after 2017. But, and with the West having the hands tied because of the Rohingya crisis, Japan has moved in in a big way to fill that vacuum. And you can see that Japan is not more active than there have been in many years, trying to counter China's influence, trying to offer the Myanmar government, the Myanmar military alternative to have a dependence on China. And I'm certain that the government and the military, both of them are here, they agree, they're in agreement, they're in agreement. They will welcome that. India, yes, they will welcome that too. But India seems to be too preoccupied with its own internal problems and what's happening on the Western border. But if India were to pay more, pay more attention to what's happening on its eastern border, I certainly think you know, there would be many opportunities there to improve relations and to help Myanmar reestablish its position as a neutral power in, in between South and Southeast Asia. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Bertel. That was a very interesting deliberation. Now I move on to Yumi. Yumi, would you please go ahead and share with us your observations? Yes. Uh, I think the two speakers have already covered a lot of ground and raised a lot of issues. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just highlight uh, three major political trends that I see, uh, as a, you know, from, particularly from these uh, election results. Uh, the first is uh, that, and in fact, uh, keeping these trends in mind, the question is whether the NLD government in the second term would be able to uh, reframe some of the political narratives in the country, uh, particularly in redefining some of the, 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 the narrow national you know, identity of the country. Uh, let me start with the first trend that I see, which is the, the results again is a reconfirmation and represented a, a rejection of the military and its proxy parties. Uh, I think uh, what this means for civil military relations is again interesting. The earlier speakers have uh, said um, a lot on this. Let me just add that um, I agree with uh, both of them. And um, we have already heard that there are reports about uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the military chief uh, Ming Ong Lea already met um, earlier this month. Um, so the Outcomes, um, there are different scenarios being talked about. I think one of the scenario, uh, scenarios, yes, I think if, if these two uh, strike a, a deal uh, for you know, the NLD, the Osan Suchi, allowing the military chief to continue his tenure for a few more years, who retires, actually retires next year, and the military actually accommodating the Aung San Suu Kyi to become the president by waiving the you know, Article 59F, uh, which again, these are all you know, uh, questions, open uh, questions. We don't know what, how this will uh, you know, uh, 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 turn out. But the, the question is the civil military relations between the two, uh, 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 between these two uh, political forces would remain an, an important, uh, an important feature of, of the country's politics uh, going forward. Uh, one question is whether the the military, the Takmado and and the Aung San Suu Kyi will be able to reframe some of their that the the the, the dynamics in in the relationship between the two, uh, whether they would accommodate each other by you know. Uh, 
may be reforming some of the constitutional amendments in uh, uh, that that was you know, uh, um, uh, 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 that actually today uh, provides a power sharing uh, system uh, arrangement between the two. Uh, the second that I see is uh, the popularity of the NLD among the ethnic uh, voters. Now, a simplistic exam uh, explanation would be that, you know, the ethnic voters are voting for the NLD to defeat the military, you know, proxy parties, particularly the USDP, which is, you know, often an explanation that is given. I think uh, probably if you look at the 2015 elections uh, results and also now the 2020, uh, it seems to me that there probably are more to, you know, more to that factor alone. Probably uh, the question, therefore, is uh, are the ethnic uh, voters uh, looking beyond the ethnic identity politics today? Uh, if we actually stretch that argument, one can even go to, to, to say that whether you know, this, uh, the ethnic-based nationalism that has defined ethnic politics in Myanmar, uh, are, we, are we seeing this, this, uh, this sort of uh, political ideology changing in, in, uh, in the ethnic areas, in the ethnic, ethnic states? I think that, again, is it's too early to make you know, uh, conclusions on this, but I think we are moving towards a certain direction where ethnic uh, voters are clearly uh, making certain choices which need not necessarily be explained by how we have explained so far in terms of, you know, voting for supporting the NLD just to keep the military out. I think that uh, probably is too narrow uh, an explanation today. Uh, then uh, the, the other, I think, factor that we are seeing is that after post-election results, we are seeing uh, reports that uh, there are fears in fighting among some of the ethnic parties. Uh, the question, therefore, uh, as a result of the poor, you know, poor, poor performance in the elections, I think the question, therefore, is uh, what does this say about ethnic part, political parties, the future of ethnic political parties in Myanmar's democratic uh, you know, uh, 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 system? So the, the, the entire, you know, the debate or discourse of Myanmar politics has been, you know, democratization of the of the country. Now, as we move, as we kind of seen this the country moving towards democracy we are also seeing that uh, a political a political force the the, the ethnic uh, political uh, voice which was seen as one of one the the, the uh, an, an important voice that uh, as democracy creates peace they would find voice in that we uh, what if you know nld what we are seeing today is that nld actually is um, you know uh, outperforming ethnic parties in ethnic states. So what does this mean? I mean, dem what does democracy mean for ethnic parties then or ethnic uh, voters? I think uh, the third set of or the third trend that one is seeing is that it is again, the election results again is a strong rebirth uh, of the ultra Buddhist uh, nationalism uh, forces. Uh, if you recall um, the hardline, Buddhist nationalist monk uh, Viratu uh, called his supporters to support uh, parties that would protect um, race and religion just before the elections. Then um, we also saw um, the party, the National uh, Development Party, which uh, fought uh, with the platform of, uh, on the platform uh, based on the platform of Buddhist nationalist uh, uh, for, um, uh, nationalist. Uh, 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 what you call uh, politics uh, did not did not win any seat. I mean, and, and it's not only this time. Uh, in 2015, also it, it did not win any seat. And uh, this time again, we have seen it has not uh, won any seat. So the question is that uh, the three traditional political forces: the military, the ethnic, uh, you know, the ethnic uh, politics, the ethnic voice. Uh, and the Buddhist uh, monks uh, have traditionally defined Myanmar politics uh, and played a key, a key role in shaping and in uh, shaping the dynamics of this country's politics. Uh, today, what we are seeing, uh, if you look at the last 10 years, I mean, the, and the last two elections, 2015 and, and, and the November elections, it appears to me that uh, surely there are new 
trend, new, new dynamics emerging uh, in, in, in the country's politics, defined not necessarily and not only by these, uh, these, these traditional forces, but also by other, other, you know, other political discourses. And I think uh, it may be too early to, to give a name or to, to, to define this phenomenon, but perhaps we are move, moving towards a political discourse of, of defined by development and if not step, uh, peace, as some form of stability. I'll stop here for now, Sripana. Thank you, Yomi. You have raised very crucial and important, I think, questions in my mind because you were talking about democracy. So uh, I'll, I'll first like to start with you. So do you think that apart from uh, democratic elections, Simultaneous growth of democratic institutions and democratic culture is being nurtured in Myanmar, which is crucial for turning Myanmar into a resilient democracy. I would really like to know what are your thoughts on it. So is I think, uh, uh, is that for me or? Uh, Shibana? Yes, it, it is for you, Yome, and then, okay. uh, you know, Bhattar can also take it up. Sure. Otherwise, better you can go ahead if you want. Yeah. That's not a problem here. Yeah. OK, I actually, uh, I just want to add something about the ethnic parties, which is that, yes, the trend you described is, is correct, but it's not the whole picture. If Take Kachin State, for instance. Until 1994, there was civil fighting there. There was no migration. But there was a very large Shan minority there, called Shani or Red Shan for some reason who made up almost half the population of Kachin state. But since the KA actually signed the Kachin Independence Army, actually signed a ceasefire agreement with the government in 1994, there's been a lot of migration to Kachin state, not only from, from uh, Burma proper, but also from Rakhine state, a very poor state. If you go to the Pakhan Jain mines today, you will find thousands of Rakhine working there. And also they work in banana, banana plantation, road construction, that sort of thing. So, uh, I would think that today the Kachins have been reduced to a minority in the state. And you would hard to find it's because they've got the majority system, you know, for elections like we have in India, the old British system. You need to have a majority in the constituency in order to, to win a seat. And there are probably very few constituencies in Kachin state where the Kachins are a majority today. If they had a proportional system, the outcome would be different. If you look at Shan State, there's a similar pattern there. In urban areas, uh, most urban areas, NAD won. But if you look at the Shan heartland in Central Shan State, where there are very few migrants from the rest of the country, the Shan part is won. So the, Shan, the ethnic factor is still there. It may become less important than it was in the past, but because of the, the system that, uh, the, under which the elections are held, and because of or massive migration to the border areas. The demographic pattern of the whole country has actually changed a lot over the past decade or two. So I think that is something we must have to take into consideration as well. But if you're talking about the opposition in the country, that's more interesting because is it going to come from the ethnic armed groups? Well, the war is going to continue. There's no doubt about that. And the political parties, there is no real credible opposition to the NLD. But what we're seeing and what we've seen in the country for the, over the past decade or so is the emergence of civil society organizations, you know, women's organizations, youth organizations, the media, environmental groups, and so on. And they are increasingly playing the role of being the kind of unofficial or, or outside the parliament uh, op uh, opposition to the government, the, the kind of public watchdog is keeping the government in check. And I think that is a de development we would have to look at quite carefully. But there was some attempt, attempt to set up a new party, like the Putin party by Kokuji and so on. It failed miserably. It just didn't get on work. But there are a lot of things happening in human society today. And that is also in the ethnic areas across the country, which are more interesting than, you know, the formation of a new political party. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Can I just yes, add one? Please, please, Yomi. Yeah. So, no, I completely agree with uh, Brittle on, uh, you know, the 
Today, Myanmar doesn't have a viable opposition. Now, if you talk about democracy, I think, uh, as uh, Bertel clearly said, uh, today the opposition is not coming from political parties. NLD dominates in the union parliament and also in most of the ethnic states. Uh, now, uh, you can talk about you know, the media playing its role, the civil society playing its role, uh, but again, we have seen in the past five years again, the, the media also, the restrictions that have been put on, uh, on, on, on media, uh, on journalists, uh, arrest of journalists, uh, these stories keeps coming up. So the question is, uh, if you have political parties not playing that role in the parliament and in the legislative uh, assemblies, and you have outside the parliament or outside the parliamentary system, uh, you have media and other you know, uh, uh, civil societies not given the space to play that role. Uh, how do we then define you know, democracy in, in a country like Myanmar? I think that again throws up different you know, issues for us to understand. Thank you, Yome. Uh, the next question I think I would like to ask that what explains the enduring popularity of Aung San Suu Kyi as reflected in the recent elections, despite the ensuing domestic challenges? Is it that democracy is slowly taking firmer roots in the country or is it the personality cult and the popular appeal of Suu Kyi which is driving the democratic politics within Myanmar? So uh, would Michael, would you want to go first and answer? Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to hear um, well that uh, that you mentioned this topic because this is one of my favorite ones. But before that, I would like to follow up what Bertil Lindner said about the this structure, the system based by the military, um, um, constructed by the constitution of uh, in 2008. Um, there was a nice quote in the 80s by a Chinese um, uh, politician Chen Yun who said um, that a free market is like a bird in the cage. It's free, but it's in the cage. So I would say that the NLD's um, position within the um, uh, Tatmadaw-based um, system is exactly like the bird. Uh, it is free, but it is in the cage. And the most important uh, political question in Myanmar is whether this bird would be able, would be able to, to, to fly away from, from this cage, uh, uh, or, or it can only negotiate like be better uh, standing within the cage. Uh, uh, I think the latter is more probable, but well, we shouldn't fall into determinism, but, uh, but nevertheless, I would still, still tend to think about, about Myanmar this, this way, as, as a, uh, uh, via this metaphor. As for reasons for those who um, those whose victory. I would say um, there are four, uh, four major ones. Uh, two are uh, irrational and two are rational. Um, um, I would start from irrational because they are somehow uh, more um, shallow, I would say, but, uh, but still the irrational is of course the AMSU, the, 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 the link between the, the nation and, uh, and, uh, and, and the leader. Um, it's based, well, the Burmese say it's because of the trust, because of uh, what she did for the country and so on. And of course we can rationalize it some way, but it's, I think it's still quite difficult for foreigners to understand this, this link between, between the leader and, uh, and the people. It's somehow unique. Um, uh, it, it plays a role. Uh, the second irrational, irrational um, uh, explanation, I would say, would be the Mahasamata style of democracy, where we elect the most moral one, the most proper one. Uh, but uh, with irrational, with this kind of argumentation, we should be very cautious between, be, because um, quite often in political science, when we cannot understand something, we uh, delegate it into the sphere of culture. So this, this should be taken with caution because this is a self-explanatory in a way. That's why I prefer the two rational reasons why Suchi, those Suchi won. Well, first of all is that people still remember the pre-2015 era or rather pre-2010 because it was much worse then. 
Uh, and uh, and what the Tatmadaw did to the people is still not forgotten. Uh, the, 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 the threat or the menace of, of Tatmadaw is still in the living memory, although Myanmar is no longer the, living in silence, as there was a good book a uh, couple of decades ago. Uh, it's no longer living in silence, but it still remembers this silence very well. And no one wants, um, except perhaps a couple of nomenclatura, military nomenclatura people, um, no one wants the generals to come back to power, either in civilian dress or in, in uniforms. And Suchi is still the major shield against, against the generals uh, coming back to power. So as long as she can function uh, this way, she will win any election. This this, this is obvious. And the second rational um, um, explanation would be that uh, those Sulu's government was not that bad. I mean, I would say it was not excellent, but it was not a disaster. It was a so-so government. It has some successes. Um, it, I would say the most important success of this government has been the fact that it continued the, the transformation. And the transformation was uh, a good thing per se for, for, for the country because it opened up uh, Myanmar to the, to the global world. It enabled cyber revolution, for example. It enabled reconnecting with, with the world. People live better life now. They are much, much less afraid of the, of the Tatmado. This, this threat has not disappeared but it, 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 it got lessened, it's, it's, it's much less than it used to be. People can talk in the tea house without, without this fear, like everyone who was in Myanmar, we all were, I think, um, uh, before 2011 remembers this fear. This fear was so omnipresent and it's no longer there. Um, so, so, and this is important that uh, in a way, the NLD government tamed uh, um, limited Tatmadaw's uh, influence in the society in many aspects, uh, from uh, from well uh, this famous changing buses in uh, in uh, in Yangon to to more important things. But uh, and and this is important. So this was not that bad government. I I would say it was average government. And uh, although people tend to criticize um, criticize NLD or sometimes even those who more than they used in the past it's still uh, there is still a feeling that they should have more time to to continue so i i would say these two rational explanations are the most important but the negative one that those two is a shield against the tatmado i think plays the, the 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 most important is is the most important role it's the most important one thank you thank you michael uh... Uh, I, I also was wondering that how soon could the NLD2 government restart the process of constitutional reforms since it has come back to power? And what will be the NLD's government's strategy to get the reforms vetted by the military janta? So, would Patil, would you want to answer this? Well, first of all, I would say that I agree with Mishat all the four points. Very, very succinct, very right on. I mean, that, that is exactly what we're talking about, yeah. And I like the energy of the, the, the bird in the cage. That's <laughs> described the situation very well. Well, as I said before, there's no way there's going to be any meaningful constitutional reform unless the military says so. Because they can veto any attempt to change the constitution. And I have actually in private <coughs> discussions with the younger officers in the Damador. <coughs> they made it very clear to me that <clears throat> they're not going to change. <clears throat> they don't see the time and structure that, not yet. It won't happen within the foreseeable future. I think it's as easy as that. It's not going to happen. Some smaller things, yes, may change, like the GD being transferred and maybe some, she can become president of state, instead of state councillor or something like that, change the title. But anything that has to do with the fundamental power structure of the country is highly unlikely to change within the foreseeable future. Maybe after the next election, maybe after two elections, but certainly not during you know, the five years we have ahead of us now. So, uh, Bertil, we have a question from the audience for you. It is saying that, do you think Tatmadaw would tone down its anti-Suki stance by waving down Article 59F 
when she stood by the by them in the ICJ? <laughs> well, I, th I think one of the reasons why the LND scored such a success to, at the polling booth this year, the outside world would disagree with this, but people in Burma would tell me that this is actually what happened. She went to The Hague to defend the honor of the country, the pride of the country, without the help of the military. That made her more popular than before. Of course, I mean, the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. They talk about the Rohingya, genocide, this, that, and the other. People in the country see it very differently. But that's one, one reason why I think she is getting more support. But there's something very curious happened the day she spoke in The Hague. Suddenly, there was a military show of force in downtown Yangon. He claimed it was a rehearsal for the 43rd or 47th, whatever it was, anniversary of the, of the foundation of the Myanmar Navy, well, Highland likely. The way I interpreted it, and I could be wrong, but it, this way I interpreted it, and many of my friends in the country share that, that view, there was a show of force from the military said, look, wait a minute, you're talking about court marshals and all the sort of things in the Hague. It's not your business. We are in charge here. So it was actually directed against her, not in support of her. Of course, now she's come back and things have been patched up. But I don't think that they will, in order to thank her for what she did in The Hague, agree to constitutionally change, to change any important clauses in the constitution. No, I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. So, do you think Suchi's thumping electoral victory will better strengthen her to combat the international criticism of her handling the Rohingya crisis? Is that to me as well? Yes. Uh, well, actually, I don't think that is going to change the outside world's uh, attitude towards her and the Rohingya crisis. But there is another issue. And uh, if you talk to Western political leaders, in private, they're worried about Myanmar you know, drifting back into the Chinese camp if they are too harsh on the country, especially when, when it comes to the, the Rohingya issue. So therefore, you can see how the West is sort of soft peddling that issue. They have to say certain things, they have to condemn it, and they have to ask for the return of the Rohingya, which is not going to happen, they should get the citizenship and that sort of thing. But by and large, what is more important than that from the West's point of view, and certainly from Japan's point of view, or the, the, the geopolitical situation. They cannot afford to let Myanmar slip back into the arms of the embrace of China once again. And therefore, I don't think they're going to push this Rohingya issue more than they've done so far. Thank you, Bottle. There is a question for Mr. Lubina. Uh, uh, it comes from Jayesh Khatu. He is asking, do you see Myanmar coming out of its busy internally image and respond to external realities like the Indo-Pacific? Will such a stance be detrimental of China? Okay. Thank you so much for, for, the, for the question. Uh, I would say that historically speaking, uh, Myanmar or Burma has always been inward looking. It has very little interest in the outside sphere. Uh, well, it, it comes to pre-colonial times, like the, the, the kings were just conquering the lands outside when they needed to white elephants or some other resources, more material. But usually, usually they didn't care much about the outside world. This is partially due to geography, partially due, due to culture. The reasons are various, but, but, but the fact is that only colonial times opened, forcefully opened Burma to the world, uh, but uh, that, that left uh, even more scars than, 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 than benefits, because the, the, pe the people uh, have, uh, well, tend to remember the colonial times usually via its vices, not, uh, not, the, uh, not some of its uh, classes. So, um, so there is a tendency, very strong tendency, 
to look um, into insight or um, uh, to isolate even. Sometimes it has an extreme version like during the win, and um, sometimes it's less less extreme. But as a rule, Myanmar is more interested in itself than in the wider world. So I don't see I don't I don't see how uh, Myanmar would um, would come back uh, to the grand uh, scheme of Indo-Pacific. Uh, it I would say the instincts would tell the the, the, the Burmese leaders to stay away from from this kind of uh, competition um, in order to not get hit. Because, uh, well, basically, as Ten Min O once uh, written, Burma is the canary in the cage of uh, US China rivalry. He wrote it 10 years ago. Uh, well, so this canary wants to survive, that's for sure. And um, and um, they they don't want to um, to to do anything that would uh, even rock the boat more than it is now. Because, well, basically, with uh, with uh, with the big picture we have uh, um, uh, such countries are like Myanmar are, are in between uh, uh, the US uh, coming back uh, or not coming back we still don't know how Biden's uh, policy will be will be in the, in the Pacific and China so I wouldn't uh, I cannot uh, envision Myanmar as a leading actor in the in the Pacific I would rather say it will be very much concentrated on its domestic affair and it will try to move away from from the from the major theater, uh, this is. Uh, but of course, we'll see. Uh, I think that, that many of what happened after 2011 was not planned, but it just happened. And uh, many things happened due to blind chances or what ad hoc actions, or uh, they are uh, well consequences of unplanned actions. So. So, although we, we can prognose, of course, but it's uh, it's it's the reality. So we, we never we never know. But as a rule, I would say that Myanmar would not be very much uh, active in the in the foreign policy. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, for Yomi, uh, I would like to ask that the growing Chinese assertiveness has become more apparent in recent times. So, how does NLD plan to balance? the other regional powers along with China? Yeah, um, I think if you look at the uh, NLD's policy in the last five years, uh, clearly it has adopted a cautious approach towards China. I mean, yes, it has signed the BRI, it has uh, signed several uh, you know, infrastructure development uh, projects with China, uh, part of the you know, BRI, um, the uh, China Myanmar Economic Corridor, but at the same time, uh, the policies that it has adopted uh, and some of the mechanisms that it has put in place, uh, for instance, you know, uh, setting up a monitoring uh, mechanism uh, to, to monitor the, uh, keep track of the strategic projects uh, in Myanmar uh, to, to ensure there is transparency, to ensure that there is, uh, you know, uh, 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 the financial, uh, it does not become, you know, a debt trap into uh, the Chinese uh, uh, debt diplomacy. Uh, then also, uh, it has also been, uh, it has also ensured to scale down some of the projects such as the Jokfu Deep Sea Port. Uh, you know, and interestingly, it took, you know, assistance from the, from the, from the Americans. Uh, so I think it has been playing this, you know, balancing game uh, to, 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 to reduce uh, its dependence on China. And the fact that you know countries like uh, Japan has been brought in and it's increasing, it's it's expanding its role in not only in infrastructure development but also in, uh, in the peace process. You know the uh, the the government, uh, the Japanese have just recently, uh, uh, special representative has just recently uh, brokered a peace fire with the Arakan Army and the and the Dakmado. So I think uh, it's the the NLD government also is trying to play a very cautious in a game with the Chinese, uh, bringing in all other, you know, uh, uh, as far as possible, it's trying to diversify its, its economic diplomacy, um, bringing in South Korea, uh, India, uh, ASEAN countries, China, uh, Japan, definitely, and also some of the Western countries. And I think, as uh, the earlier speakers have also said, I think the Americans are also trying to find a way to re-engage the, the NLD government, um, they're trying to find a balance between human rights and engagement, security issues. So I think we are going to see, uh, I would assume that uh, the, the new Biden government would also adopt 
a more uh, balanced approach towards Myanmar, keeping in mind, you know, the, the rivalry with China, of course, uh, to counter China uh, as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. And that, I think we are going to see the NLD, that would create some space for the NLD to also engage with, with, the, with the United States and probably with some of the European countries as well. Batil, uh, would you like to also add something to what Yome just said? No, I agree with the two previous speakers. And uh, the Myanmar would become a regional kind of power player. No, not at all. They were inward looking, just looking at trying to find a balance between all the outside influences. I mean, the only time that Myanmar has been sort of active in the sort of uh, outside its own boundaries, so to speak, would be in the non aligned movement, typically. Of course, you had Otan, who was the general secretary of the United Nations, but he was a bit of a dissident. He was no friend of uh, the government at that time, and he had his own ideas. But I think uh, uh, what, what we're going to see is an attempt to balance, especially the growing Chinese influence. And that is happening. And uh, as uh, you only right, right pointed out, the Japanese are very active in a number of ways. Uh, investment, <clears throat> some private advice in the, you know, behind closed doors, uh, the so-called peace process, where China actually became the only force that it really mattered a couple of years ago. Later, the U.S. Sasakawa, who is the, the special envoy to, to Myanmar, who is very active, how successful he is, though, well, I'm not 100% sure that he has actually managed to establish some kind of peace in that kind of state, a temporary ceasefire in Yes, maybe, but that conflict is going to go on, continue for a very long time. Thank you, Bertil. So, as we are slow, clo slowly drawing towards the close, I want to ask the last question, and I would really want all three of you to kindly respond to the same question. So, how do you assess Myanmar government's handling of the health and economic crisis emanating from the pandemic situation? since Myanmar is facing a whole sort of rising COVID-19 cases. So in this scenario, how do you per se see how will Myanmar cope with the same? So uh, Michael, would you like to go first? Thank you. Well, this is a difficult question because, uh, or in other words, it's a good question um, because, um, well, um, there are two uh, spheres. Uh, first is the sphere of perception. In the sphere of perception, um, Myanmar government uh, behaved well, at least uh, the approach of those who, who was very much active on social media, who was encouraging, who was very much with the people, was very much on the psychological um, sphere, very much welcome. I would compare it to Merkel, by the way, in times of, uh, to German ch chancellor, in times of despair, people do need, really do need this kind of ap uh, approach from the leaders. Uh, this, of course, falls into the, into this uh, agenda or into this general Amesu uh, idea that she was indeed a sort of mother of the nation. Um, so, so in this regard, and of course it had, it has, it had, it has, still has, political benefits for her, that's, that, that goes without saying, but it's not only cynicism. I would say this was a real, uh, well, a sort of uh, uh, an, a approach that this is my nation and I need to reassure it somehow. So in terms of psychological aspect, I would say that the approach was very well, in, 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 it was very well done. Now, uh, much more difficult to assess is the, uh, well, on the ground um, actions on the, of, the, of the government. We need to remember that Myanmar is a weak state. Uh, it's maybe not failed state, but, uh, but it's still a weak state with weak state institutions, with, uh, with a very poor and weak uh, healthcare. And this is not uh, NLD's fault. This is the fault of the Tatmado, of the 60 years of the Tatmado rule. Uh, so you cannot change it overnight. Like 10 years or 15 years ago, Myanmar was the, a country, the, the lowest country in the world in, the, in terms of, or one of the lowest in terms of spending on, on healthcare. 
repair. So you cannot uh, you cannot repair this kind of things uh, overnight. Uh, and and the NLD government has been um, the, the, the health minister was generally uh, valued well that he he did well, uh, which is not uh, not the case uh, with many other ministers. Let's say this way. Um, um, but uh, so well, we need to remember that um, that. Um, well, that this is this is a weak state, and in within its capabilities, I would say it behaved not that bad. But still, um, Myanmar has not been hit that hard. I mean, I know in September or in October, the, 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 this wave was much harder, harsher than than the previous one. But still, when we compare it to other countries, the situation was not that bad. I would say. Uh, so. Um, well, external circumstances were maybe not favorable, but still not that bad. So I would uh, I would say that in terms of real approach, um, again, it was acceptable. Uh, I think it was acceptable. Um, uh, yeah, but but uh, I, I wouldn't um, like. This is more I bet that I than than I uh, than I uh, well that I'm I'm very much sure of. I, I would rather bet that this was not. Not um, not disastrous. Thank you. Bottle, would you like to add to this? <clears throat> no, yes, Michelle is absolutely correct. I mean, if you look at the official statistics here, you see that Yangon, Mandalay, Bago, and a few other urban centers in central Myanmar, you find a lot of infections, a lot of hospital treatments, a lot of deaths. If you move out in the frontier area, it's down to almost zero. That reflects one fundamental thing here. That's uh, the lack of resources. In urban areas, yes, you have reasonable resources. If you go to Chin State or parts of Shan State and so on, but not at all. But we had here in Thailand, for instance, uh, a number of people came back illegally from Canton in the eastern Shan State. Sneaked across the border and were apprehended and tested COVID positive and, and immediately sent off to for treatment. But if you look at the official statistics from the same area which they came from, it's almost nothing. So it is a question of the lack of resources in the frontier areas, but not a lack of will on the part of the government. I think they're trying to do the best and they have done better than I think most people would have expected, given the very limited sources, resources they have at their disposal, especially in the outlying areas. Thank you, Vata. Yomi? No, I agree with the earlier speakers. Uh, I think what is interesting is that, uh, you know, part of the reason why, you know, some say the uh, NLD has won uh, is also, you know, some of the credit is also given to the way they have handled the COVID, uh, you know, uh, pandemic. Yes. So I think uh, it. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Professor Lovina. Perception has also been, you know, a, a factor here uh, at play. Um, I think uh, the country today is. Above, I think the last I saw was the third highest in in the ASEAN countries. So I think the situation is still very uncertain. Uh, so far, it seems to me, I agree with both, the government has, despite all its limitations, has handled the situation well. But we'll have to wait and see how it pans out, you know, as the, I think the number has now plateaued around 1,000 uh, per day. So if it increases beyond this, then what happens? I think we'll have to wait and see. But so far, perhaps, yes, I agree with the government has done well. In, 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 in at the, both in terms of perception as well as in terms of you know uh, on the ground as well perhaps. Okay, so we have to wait and see how I think COVID cases uh, you know continue and how the government continues to tackle it, and we I think will come up with a much better answer to that. So this brings us to the end of our talk today. I thank Michael Lubina, Bertil Littner, and K. Yome for such an engaging and enriching discussion. I thank all the participants for joining us today and sending their questions. Very good evening to all of you.